Hey everybody. <laughs> uh, happy Sunday, Brian here. Uh, we are live, looks like we've got one viewer. I'm not gonna be able to monitor the chat uh, very well. Uh, I know doing a live stream, um, sometimes I'll be dropping frames, about looks like 74% of them. Uh, so the video might be a little bit laggy, but I will later publish it uh, and put it on um, our YouTube page uh, as well. Uh, so yeah, there's no church this morning. Uh, obviously it was kind of like a close call, but that's fine. I'm just hanging out here in, uh, Rowan's room and, uh, Katie's downstairs taking care of the kids. But, uh, yeah, thank you for, for hanging out. Uh, feel free to chat with one another. Um, I'm going to do the, do the best I can today. I think, I think I've got it figured out. Uh, but yeah, if, if you'd be so kind, um, yeah, let's pray first before we get into God's word. And uh, let's see, I'm going to uh, let's swap over to this. Here we are. And okay. Whew. All right, let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, that as we hear your word, it produces faith in us. And the faith that you ask of us is not a blind faith, uh, but it is one that is evidential. Uh, our trust and hope in you for salvation and freedom from sin is based on the fact that you rose from the dead, uh, that you gave your life to forgive us of our sins. And when we believe and trust and follow you, uh, we can experience newness of life. Uh, so God, I ask that today as we hear your word, it would remind us of the truth, uh, that we would no longer walk in condemnation or shame, uh, but Lord, we would trust in you and recognize that uh, you have gifted to us your righteousness. You have exchanged holiness to us uh, when we've placed our trust in you that we could be forgiven of our sins. And uh, Lord, I just thank you for this time together and ask that your spirit would be speaking through your word this morning. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's see. So I'm going to swap over. Aha, here we go. Um, so uh, we've been going through the Gospel of Luke lately, uh, and uh, here we are where Jesus is about to preach some of the parables. The parables are certainly a little bit tricky to track with uh, sometimes. We've got to be careful not to over-apply the analogy uh, for sure, um, so we're going to do, you know, do the best we can and study God's Word together. And this is a common parable that we're going to read today, uh, but I'm hoping that you guys will find it invigorating, uh, challenging, that it would be a reminder, it would stir you up uh, to delve into God's Word more in your own time and uh, spend time with Jesus. Uh, so here we go, Luke chapter 8, verse 4. I'm going to try to read off of the screen. I'll also have my my tablet. You guys, I recommend you follow along as well, um, because I might maybe I'll skip to a verse quicker than uh, you would prefer. Or if you end up having an idea and want to open a separate tab and read the Bible there, or you know, go check out a different verse. Uh, by all means, do so. Uh, so Luke chapter eight, verse four. When a great crowd was gathering, uh, and people from town after town came to him, he said in a parable. Let's see. So Jesus is now getting quite popular. And now he's gonna say a parable, which is gonna be, I think, kind of offensive. But let's find out. Uh, a sower went out to sow his seed. So a sower, as in a farmer, uh, someone is planting seed. They're right scattering seed onto the ground. And as he sowed, some fell among the path and was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air devoured it. And some fell on the rock. As it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it. And some fell into good soil and grew and yielded a hundredfold. As he said these things, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So Jesus broadcast this parable to the crowds. And then in Matthew's account, we find out that like the disciples didn't quite understand what he meant by this. Uh, I'm guessing many in the crowds also didn't understand what he meant by this. 
And so when they catch Jesus alone, they, they finally ask him a question. And so it says, and when his disciples asked him what this parable meant, he said, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, but for others they are in parables, so that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. All right, so in the analogy of a farmer scattering seed, he says the seed, the thing that is producing life and bearing fruit, is God's word. All right, that is the thing that, that he's talking about. All right, so he's finally explaining to us what this analogy is about. And we're going to read a few parables today. Uh, so we'll be mixing metaphors, as they say. So maybe it's not a good idea, but we'll do what we can. So the seed is the word of God. The ones along the path are those who have heard. All right, so, so everyone's hearing the word of God. All right, they're, they're all being exposed to uh, what's being said here. But it says, then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. All right, so this is the first heart, the first person uh, in his series of people who hear the word of God and this is how they respond, right? They, it ends up being neglected, undervalued, uh, seen as not true. And this is a, interesting here is, there's the person scattering the word of God, uh, there's the person receiving the word of God, and now we actually see there's actually even a third party, someone who is actively trying to remove the word of God from the hearer, all right? And it says, and the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy. Right? And you might think, like, that's, that's a good thing, right? We want to receive God's word with joy. Uh, but sadly, joy alone in hearing God's truth is not an indicator of a changed life. Uh, sometimes that joy is fickle. Uh, so it says, but, those, but these have no root. They believe for a while and in time of testing, fall away. All right, and so their discernment of truth is such that when life becomes difficult or it wasn't the thing that they thought it was, uh, they cease to believe it is true, right? Maybe they have a hard time reconciling what God's word says uh, to the life that they're experiencing. All right, and, and to a degree, we should expect a degree of consistency between those things. Because the God of the Bible also claims to be the creator of the earth, the author of life, the author and finisher of our faith. Uh, and so if he's sovereign, right, Lord over all the earth, judge of the living and the dead, uh, if he's got authority over these things, we would expect there to be a degree of consistency. All right, but fortunately... The word of God that we see is not one that proclaims false hopes. Uh, it's not one that uh, says that the life of a Christian is somehow going to be super easy. Uh, so, so unfortunately, these people fell away because of a misconception, uh, or they just didn't think it was worth it, right? Life is just too hard. And as for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear, but as they are on their way, uh, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. All right, and so, so here we see these aren't people who are caught up in life being difficult. They're caught, it, caught up in life being good or having cares regarding life, worries about life, uh, pleasure in life, and they're falsely assessing the pleasure that this life has to offer as being more valuable than the things that God word, God's word would promise them. And so as a result, as a plant, they're, they're sapped, they're choked out uh, by these weeds. And as for that in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patience, all right? And so the fruit that God's word produces in our lives is one that comes about with, with patience, right? So it's not going to be an immediate thing. It's going to take 
time. All right, and so we end up see, seeing Jesus read this parable, and, and right, he said the parable to the large crowd. Uh, he gives the explanation to his disciples, but what I want to suggest is that even in this parable, Jesus is saying that, hey, a lot of people are going to hear my words, but not all of them are going to receive them. Not all of them are going to believe me. Right? Not all of them are going to trust me. And, and so Jesus, I want to suggest, he recognizes that he's not going to keep the crowd. What Jesus cares about is people. He doesn't care about a crowd. Jesus is willing to speak the truth, right, to bring change and life to those who hear him. But if that comes at the cost of the crowd, if that comes at the cost of favor and fame, he's willing to risk it, right? And actually later on, I hope we make it there today, uh, there's a moment where Jesus says some offensive things where the entire crowd walks away. And he even turns to his disciples and says, are you, are you guys going to go too? All right. And so, so I want to point out, Jesus longs for and loves people, right? Jesus desires that no one would perish and all would reach repentance and come to trust him and experience the life that he offers. But at the same time, he's not going to change the truth in order to make more people like him, all right? And so, so that's what Jesus is, is willing to do. Now, in this parable, right, there's someone who's scattering seed. They're spreading the word of God, and Jesus, in a sense, is doing that same thing, right? He is sharing the word of God. And when a farmer scatters seed, it's not like they're just trying to be like, oh man, I've got all this extra seed. I've got to get rid of this stuff. This stuff is useless to me. No, no, no. no. Like a farmer is doing this work with the intent of getting fruit in return. All right. So his objective isn't to scatter seed or to get rid of seed. His objective is for the seed to grow and for it to bear fruit that it can be harvested. Right, And then he'll also get more seed from that and be able to plant more uh, crops and get more fruit. Right, so, so that's the goal of the farmer. All right? and, and in this story, in this parable, I want to point out, God wants us to bear fruit. All right? God's desire is that when we respond to his word, we would experience life. Right, That we would hold fast to that word and trust it, experience the life that he wants us to have. He wants us to bear fruit. All right, so God is not content for us to be fruitless. All right, that, that's what I want to point out. And, and I'm actually going to fast forward in Luke right now to another parable that makes that plain. And so this is in uh, Luke chapter 13. Once again, Jesus speaking, and this is what he says. And he told this parable. Uh, so we're, we're going to get a little bit of swap of roles uh, a little bit. There's a farmer, right, that was scattering seed in the first one, and the people were the ground. Let's see what happens. And, and he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. Uh, so there's this owner of the, the vineyard. And he came seeking fruit on it and found none. All right, so the owner of the vineyard planted this fig tree for the intent of it producing figs. Right? That's, that's why he wanted it. It wasn't just there for aesthetic reasons. He wanted figs. And he wanted this tree to produce figs. And he sought it at the right time and found none. Okay? And he said to the vine dresser, so now here's another character, someone who tends his vineyard. He says, look, for three years, now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. But it down. Why should it use up the ground? And so you're like, oh man, like this is, this is rough. Like, okay, so this, this tree was fruitless and he's willing to completely just get rid of this tree because it's not doing the thing that he wanted it to do. And you're like, okay, what's Jesus going to say, right? Jesus, he's merciful. He's gracious. Uh, what is Jesus going to tell us in this parable, right? Hopefully there's a happy ending uh, for us when or maybe not as fruitful as, as we'd want, right? Like, I mean, we've been through seasons of life like that. Let's find out. And he answered him, Sir, let it alone this year also, 
until I dig around it and put on manure. Then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, then you can cut it down. All right, and so, so here's another story. There's the owner and the vine dresser. All right, the owner planted this fig tree and wanted fruit. He didn't just want a tree, he wanted fruit from the tree. And, and he intends on there being fruit, and he sought it for three years. And I want to point out, this guy is not some amateur farmer. He doesn't have a single fig tree. He didn't, like, plant it, and then as it's, like, a little sprout, like, he's just trying to figure out, like, any fruit on it? Any fruit? No, no, no. Like, he's got a lot of these things. He would know to wait for it to be mature enough for seeking a fruit to make sense. All right, I ended up looking up online on some gardening website. Fig trees usually take at least two years before they can bear fruit, before they're mature enough. And so this guy has technically waited at least five years, right, for this fig tree. And, uh, and a fig tree will take actually at most six years to bear fruit. Uh, same, same website, oddly enough. And so actually the vine dresser and this whole parable seems to be consistent even with modern care of fig trees. Uh, and so the vine dresser says, hey, give it one more year. That would bring it to the sixth year, right? The last year in which you would expect a healthy plant to bear fruit. And, and so what's interesting here is that both of these characters desired for the plant to bear fruit. All right, both of them agreed that there would come a time in which cutting this tree down would make sense. All right, so, so even though the vine dresser is more gracious, his grace for this tree is not unending. There's, there's an end of the expected time when it's like, this thing is not doing what it's supposed to, and I'm going to cut it down. All right, uh, maybe the parable here is that, right, God continues to give us his word, his truth, and invests in us. But by the end of our lives, he's expecting us to have made a commitment to believe in him and experience the new life that he desires for us to have. All right, so God doesn't give us all of eternity to decide whether or not we trust him, whether or not we believe him. All right, and so, so this is what we see, right? That, that both of these characters agreed there comes a time to cut this tree down. And the vine dresser, he intends on giving this tree care and giving it nourishment and, right, tending to this tree, probably watering this plant and it completely investing in this tree. But he doesn't intend on doing those things vainly, right? He's not doing it so that the tree will continue to just look like a tree. No, he wants fruit from this tree, all right? And so his investment in the tree has with it the attached belief that it will one day bear fruit. And if it doesn't, he realizes that his investment is, is no longer worth it. All right? And so what I want to point out from this parable is that God is not content with us being fruitless. God is not content with us never changing as a result of his word. Right? Or as Jesus says, right, like he doesn't want us to just hear the word. He wants us to, to do something with it, right? That the wise person hears the word of God and does it, right? And that doing, I don't want to complicate too much, right? For a new person that's just hearing this for the first time and has never trusted in Jesus, right? Doing the word is literally believing on the person that God sent, okay? Like, we are saved by grace through faith, and it's not of works, right? This is really good news. So it's not, we're not saved because of our own good works. But once we encounter God's word, once we hold fast to God's word, it's going to bring about fruit in us because that's what it does, right? God is going to be at work sanctifying us, making us more and more like him. We're going to be called to do good works, right, that he's foreordained for us to walk in. All right, so once we encounter Jesus, once we're saved completely by his grace and not our own merit, it produces fruit in us. All right, and so, so I want to point out here, God is not content with a fruitless life. And so we might be like, okay, so I've got to bear 
a fruit. But that's also not what God wants, okay? Uh, right? God's not content for me to bear a single fruit, right? Like, he'd be thrilled about it, but God's not willing to leave it that way, right? I know, like, sometimes uh, our human hearts, in the, in the odd way it is, like, we'll do a good work just enough so that we feel good about ourselves. And that's not what God's looking for. He's not like, I don't want you to just do one good work. I don't want you to just give to the poor one time and like share about it on Facebook. I don't want you to take selfies of you handing a burger to a homeless man and be like, look at me, I did my good work, right? God doesn't want you taking picture with the one fruit that you've ever like brought about in your life. God wants more than that, right? Let's check out this next uh, parable. This is from John. And this Jesus is actually saying the night before he died. He says, and once again, mixing metaphors here, he says this, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Okay, so this time now, Jesus is the plant, and God the Father is the one tending the plant, okay? And he says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, all right? You and I, right, those who hear God's word are the branches, okay? Uh, and so similar analogy, he says, if someone's never going to bear fruit, God will eventually get rid of that branch. Okay. But then he says this, and every branch that does bear fruit, right? That's what God wants. That's what, that's what we want. Every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it might bear more fruit. Okay. So, so even when someone bears fruit, God's like, you know what? I can still shape their life. I can cut away the unfruitful branches. I can do work in them in such a way that they will be more fruitful. All right, that the Christian life, it's not like uh, you do a thing or you, you, know, you trust in Jesus and now you're done, you've graduated. No, no, no. For the rest of your life, God is continuing to shape you to make you more like him, right? Like, that's what God wants to do. So he's, he's not content that, like, you've got one piece of fruit to show for your life. He's like, hey, if I, if I prune away some of these other things that are fruitless, you will bear more fruit. If I cut away these things that are, right, sappers, <laughs> you're going to bear more fruit. So God's not content with just a single fruit. He wants more fruit. He wants much fruit. And we'll see the same thing as, as this continues. He says, already you are clean, now Jesus is speaking to his disciples, because of the word that I've spoken to you. And actually, my, my buddy Greg from church, he actually pointed out to me that this word clean is the same, it's the same word as prune in the Greek. Uh, and so, so what it means like clean, it's like, you know, you're cleaning your plant, you're cutting away uh, the sappers, you know, every season or whatever. Uh, that's what it's talking about. And so... The means through which God plants in us to produce fruit is his word, right, from the first parable. And now we're finding out from this parable that the means through which God produces more fruit in us is also because of his word. That God's word is going to at times correct us and cut away the things in us that are unfruitful. Right? God will cut away the outward behaviors that are unfruitful. God will deal with the attitudes of our heart that are still fleshly and wrong and selfish, right? Like God is going to prune away those things that were more and more like him. And the main way that he does that is through his word. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. I got to pick up the pace. Jesus says, now here's another component. Abide in me. Right? Remain in Jesus. Stay connected to the vine. Right? Be with Jesus. He says, abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. What's his point? Neither can you unless you abide in me. So not only do we need to hold fast to God's word, remain in his word, but we also got to remain with Jesus, like spend time with Jesus. Right? He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. Okay, so like the Christian life isn't a single encounter with Jesus. It's not a prayer you prayed one time at camp or at a Christian concert or at church on Easter, right? Like 
It is a lifetime spent continuing, remaining with, following Jesus. And that is the life that produces fruit. And he says, for apart from me, you can do nothing. All right, that Jesus is saying a life attempted to be lived separate from Jesus, separate from his word is going to be a fruitless and useless life. It will have zero eternal value to it, right? And so this is, once again, offensive stuff, but Jesus loves us, Jesus invites us, into relationship with him, and he wants to see us do the things that he's called us and purposed us for in this world. Right? He says, if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. Right? So once again, the same analogy. Jesus is saying, hey, a fruitless branch isn't worth the resources that it takes to sustain. Right? It's, it's not worth it. And he says, but if you abide in me and my words, once again, the word of God, abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. And so God wants us to bear much fruit, not just fruit, much fruit. Right? So God's not done with us. He's invested in us for the long haul. He wants to see more fruit come out of our lives. And it doesn't come about as a result of like my like effort or hard work or whatever. Like, no, no, no. It comes out as a, as a result of spending time with Jesus and spending time exposing my heart and my brain right, to his words. Just continue in, in that and it's going to happen. And then he says, as a result of bearing much fruit, you'll prove to be my disciples. Right, that other people will see the fruit in your life and immediately know that is a follower of Jesus. Right, that we will bear fruit in keeping with repentance, as John the Baptist says. Or right, uh, as, right, as Jesus says, like you can judge a tree by its fruit. Right, that even though like, right, Jesus says, right, judge not lest you be judged, he's, he's talking about hypocritical judgment, but he does say, you can know whether or not someone's a believer, whether or not someone is a false teacher or a false prophet based on the fruit their life produces, right? And that's not to say that a Christian lives a perfect life. It's just to say that over time, with patience, fruit will be revealed, right? Okay, so we've had uh, three separate analogies. And what's cool here is that God is glorified when we bear fruit. So as a result of a changed life, other people will see that life and, and not just be like, wow, what a good person. No, they're going to glorify God. They'll recognize God as good. They'll recognize God more accurately, right? Perceive him more realistically in his goodness and love for humanity because of the fruit in our lives, right? That's what that's, what we're, that's what's going to happen. People will see it. The fruit in us isn't just for us, although it's good for us, right? It produces joy in us, right? Jesus actually even says that later on in John chapter 15. Like he says, I tell you this so that your joy may be full. All right, so when, when I'm talking about like this idea of bearing fruit, don't be like, oh, that's work, right? No, this is going to be the most joy-filled life that you could ever have is one in which you're spending time with Jesus and time with his word right, and bearing fruit. It's going to produce in you things that are, are good for you and good for others. Now, what's cool about this is that when Jesus shares these parables about planting and farming and pruning, uh, Jesus is not the author of these parables in just that one way of like, oh, that's pretty clever, Jesus, like pretty, pretty, pretty smart there. Uh, He's actually the author of this concept in more ways than one, all right? Uh, not only in that he came up with this analogy, right? But Jesus is the one that invented seeds. Jesus is the one that invented self-replicating life forms, right? Jesus is the one that invented the concept of fruit that can be enjoyed and that inside the fruit is 
the seed for the next generation. All right, check this out. Genesis chapter 1, page 1 of your Bible. Here we go. And God said, all right, now you might be like, okay, God the Father. Yes, the Trinity was involved in creation. Uh, John chapter 1 talks about that uh, all things were made through him, right? He was in, in the beginning with God. He was, the word was God. Uh, and in Colossians, it talks about that through Jesus, all things are made and even sustained, right? So they continue to exist because of Jesus. All right, so Jesus is God, just so you're aware. All right, and God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its own kind on the earth. And it was so. All right, that God creates with language, with his words. And we, and we see similar things today. All right, like we, we write songs with words. We write programs with language and words, right? We create stories with words. We create, right, all of these things using language and patterns and code. And God seems to have done the same thing, all right? And, and it was so, all right? And so, so next verse, the earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its own kind. And God saw that it was good. All right, so God spoke, it happened, and it was good. But what I want to point out here is, What's cool about this concept is that the first page of the Bible describes this idea of self-replicating life, all right? That everything produces after its kind, okay? That, that whatever the, the scale or scope of the concept of kind is, right? Maybe it's species, genus, family, right? But everything produces after its own kind. All right, and so Jesus, when he's pulling this parable out in the New Testament, he's playing off his own creation, the world that you and I are enjoying and observing right now, in which we see exactly the same thing. All right, plants bear fruit, yield fruit, yield seed according to their own kind, right? One kind of plant makes that same kind of plant in the future. And there's eventually a boundary between those things, right? Like an apple tree can't become like a tomato plant, all right? There's, there's limitation. There's variation within the kind, but there's boundaries that can't be passed, all right? And you might be like, Brian, I think I've heard of a theory that kind of says the opposite of that. And you, yeah, I agree. We've heard, we've heard that, right? But I want to point out that the origin of, of self-replication is, is something that can only be explained with an intelligence, all right? With uh, the only way we can explain the, the amount of information, the amount of specified complexity, right? The amount of code and language and structure and systems that are required for life to exist is with an intelligence, all right? Like the alternate theory would be that time, space, and matter, right? Properties of physics, random chance and variation that eventually, right, those things will just come about. But let, let, me, let me make some cases here. And you might be like, Brian, I, I think you're getting distracted. We were talking about the Bible. It's all right, just, just wait. It'll be worth it. It'll be worth it. Okay, so, so in, in this idea of, uh, right, within our cells, within self-replication uh, is this idea of DNA, right, which in humans there's six feet of DNA in every one of your 10 trillion cells, right? So there's a lot of language. It's a four letter code. Uh, DNA it was elucidated, you know, by Watson and Crick in some of your lifetimes. Uh, and, and it's this really cool thing that at the basis of life is this language and code, right? The same way we program things in computers, right? To make software behave in certain patterns and responses and systems and r regulatory systems, right? is the same kinds of things we see within every piece of life, all right? But this is one of the interesting things, all right? DNA is transcribed into RNA, which is then translated as instructions to build proteins, all right? DNA, RNA, and proteins. And in order for self-replication -rep to exist, 
those three things need to come in existence simultaneously. All right, any one of those things is, is complicated in its own right. We don't have an explanation for the origin of any one of those things in its own regard. All right, like we, we've been able to see amino acids form of which proteins are made from, uh, but you don't get these things through random chance. Uh, it can't happen mathematically, okay? Uh, but not only is there this interdependence between these things, all right, DNA making RNA, which is uh, translated into proteins, but there's a cyclical dependence between these things in which the proteins that are made by the RNA are also, there's thousands of kinds of these machines that are made, uh, but some of them are the very things that transcribe DNA, that un twist DNA and read a portion of it and build the RNA. The proteins are also the same machines that read the RNA and build more proteins. And so DNA can't be decoded without proteins, all right? Proteins can't be made without RNA and like there's this interdependence between all of these things and there's no way for that system to have arisen by chance at least within the probabilistic resources that our universe has, right? And so, so when we read about God creating self-replicating life, in page one of the Bible, we are now, even in our generation, beginning to grasp the complexity of what that meant. And we're observing the same sorts of things. It's really cool, right? Really cool, all right? Uh, and what's interesting is not only can the origin of life not happen, right? Just out of nothing, right? That there had to be some cause that saturated that information originally, but we also don't have a way for one uh, genus to become another genus, all right? We, we don't have a way to see that. Now within, right, within a species, there's variation. There's mutation acting upon the DNA. Errors in the code of which sometimes maybe one of them ends up being uh, positive, okay? A single point mutation has happened, right? Even in some cases, in the case of E. coli, some double point mutations have occurred that have ended up in a positive outcome, all right? So we, we have observed these sorts of things. But check this out. There's actually this, um, this guy, uh, Richard Lenski, who since 1988, has taken E. coli uh, bacteria, actually wait, the double point mutation I think I was talking about was malaria, my apologies. But this guy for, for several decades, since 1988, February 1988, uh, has been taking E. coli bacteria and just watching it. And then the next day he'll come in and, and freeze some of that generation and take the rest and put it in a new Petri dish and watch that. And he's been doing this day after day after day after day. And he's been doing this for the equivalent of more than 65,000 generations of E. coli. And as a result, it's like this long-term evolutionary study, right? And so we can actually see, okay, what sorts of things can neo-Darwinian neo mechanisms create? Right? Can random mutations happen that can then be naturally selected because they're beneficial in some way that produce new and novel function, right? That is then better for the species. And over those years, right, over those decades, we've seen some simple changes where the size of the cell has gotten bigger or the, the rate of growth of the cells has increased or the, uh, the rate of mutation in six of his like branching families, uh, have become hyper mutants where they're actually mutating at a faster rate and it doesn't seem like they'll actually be able to rein that back in because you it's actually not great to be mutating a lot you want your code to be somewhat consistent uh, but the most interesting thing is that uh, around generation 35,000 he observed right him, him and his group observed the fact that there was uh, the ability to uh, digest essentially citrate in the presence of oxygen. And it's like, oh wow, that's a new function. That's really cool, All right? That is cool. But when they found out, like when they studied the, the genome of that particular species, right? The same species, I guess, but that particular generation, they found out it was just like a single uh, regulatory gene had been switched on where it used to be able to do it in the absence of oxygen, but now it just does it all the time. And that ended up kind of being beneficial. All right, and so there is some amount of variability 
within a species, right? Mutations can happen, but what we have seen is that it can't produce novel information. That most every situation in which we see changes within a species or its DNA, it's because things are breaking in the code. All right, things are breaking in the code that it used to have some function and, and oddly enough, breaking a machine ended up being beneficial in some regard in some particular environment. All right, and, and so that's what we end up seeing. So like even in the case of uh, right, dogs, uh, there's the claim of like, hey, look at all the variety that you get from dogs. But yeah, we get a lot of variety. But we've been able to identify the fact that like snout size or tail length or color or pattern, like all of these things, right, come from yeah, some mutations, but most of it's coming from breaking genes. And I was just listening to an audiobook this week in which the guy pointed out that like even like the domestication of dogs that happened uh, was a result of breaking some genes, right, way back in an ancestor in which the broken gene, when you observe that same break in a human, in that same right location, it's actually indicative of mental illness. And so even like your friendly dog, right, cuddled up next to you on the couch right now, is only friendly with you because it's not smart enough to have realized that you could have been dangerous. All right, and so we see variation, but it's, what, it's happening in a broken direction. All right, it's happening in a direction that, that's not functioning. All right, and I realize I'm going off on this long tangent, but it's to make a point, okay, right? Jesus said what? The seed is the word of God, and the way he designed life is that it produces after its own kind, that there's limitations. It cannot become a new kind, all right? Life doesn't begin spontaneously on its own, and new kinds and novel function and new proteins, right, don't arise instantly out of nowhere. It can't happen. In fact, here's a, here's a quote from uh, July 2018. Uh, uh, it says this, this is a secular scientist. For more than half a century, it has been accepted that new genetic information is mostly derived from random error-based events. And now it is recognized that errors cannot explain genetic novelty, right? New genetic function and complexity right, the specified complexity we, we see in life. It's, it's no longer acceptable. Neo, the neo-Darwinian mechanism is no longer viewed as a functional means to produce the life that we see, the variety that we see. It can't get from one kind to another. It can't produce enough new things to get there, okay? And, and so this is what we end up seeing, right? Uh, there's limitation. But even within, right, life, like even within this like structure of DNA, RNA, and, and proteins, those proteins are then also being arranged in parts to build functional, more complex machinery within our cells. All right, I'm pointing this out because I want you to trust the word of God, okay? And what's cool is even in our own generation, we're seeing these claims in scripture further validated. And we're seeing like the oppositional view of natural materialism, that life is here uh, as a result of a cosmic accident. We're seeing that one as being a far less viable explanation, right? That we can't explain the origin of life and we can no longer mathematically explain how to get from one kind to another kind. And not only that, within those kinds, Within their cells, sometimes we'll see molecular machinery that we can't even explain how that one piece of the cell arose. So check this out. This is a classic example, and this has been unanswered for uh, 20, 25 years. This has been brought up. Let's see. I'm going to take my picture away. So this is a bacterial flagellum, and it's like the little whippy tail on the back of uh, paramecium and a whole bunch of different kind of bacteria. Uh, and it is this machine made up of a lot of proteins, okay? It's made up of a lot of different proteins. There's over, uh, there's about 25 of those parts. And this is the problem, okay? This is what's been uh, determined, is that when they do knockout experiments, when they take out one of those 25 or so parts, the whole machine fails to work. 
it's not like it becomes like 80% effective and still works, you know, spins in order to create movement for the cell. Uh, no, it just, it breaks completely. It's not 50% effective, it's 0% effective. When you knock out any one of those parts. And so the claim is this, like if random mutations are the only means for which life could arise, or new life or new function could be uh, brought about, how do you bring about something that has 25 distinct parts of which there is no benefit when one of those parts shows up or when seven of those parts show up, all right? There's no selectable advantage for natural selection to work on until every one of those parts is there. And so for all 25 of those parts to arrive at the same time, or even if some of them like were just neutral changes of, of mutations, like the probability of all of those occurring at the same time is just mathematically impossible. Our universe has, does not have enough subatomic particles that have been oscillating for 13 billion years to allow something like this to arise by chance. It can't. And not only is this end product designed, right? Not only does this end product display incredible complexity and function, but the way that it's built also exhibits design, all right? If I go drive uh, down Route 91 in Vermont between exits two and three, right? Like I'll drive over this huge bridge and I can look at that bridge and realize that it was engineered. I can see that there was like materials engineering that took place, there's architectural design, there's physical understanding, there's statics uh, that was considered that it would support the weight of the cars passing over it. I can also determine that it has a very basic function to allow people to get from one side to the other side. But not only is the final product designed, but the, the procedure in which it was built also was full of design, right? Because for like two or three years when they were building that bridge, when you drove next to it, you saw entire teams of people that were bringing materials on site. There were like project managers, right? There were all sorts of like people that were coordinating the efforts. There were machines to move the materials into location. It had to be built in a particular order. You can't just start laying bridge in empty space and expect for it to stay there. There's order. And just like there is with that bridge, design at the end and design in the sequence in which it's built with this bacterial flagellum, there's order in which it's built. That the, the parts are brought to the construction site at the appropriate time. All right, there's timing and regulation taking place, signals that are being flipped on and off as to when to build which part, right? And, and all of the materials are being brought to the site at the right time. All right, that there's, there's design, not just in the final product, but in the assembly process. And not only is there this final structure, I wanna show you like how complex, like let's just keep pinching to zoom, right? Within this flagellum, right? Within that blue part, the, the tail, it's this large tube that kind of goes off the part that spins. Within that, there are actually a whole bunch of motor proteins that transport parts up and down the length of that tube. All right, these walking proteins called kinesin that transport materials to the end of the tube for assembly uh, or transport other pieces back. So within that entire structure, there's all these moving parts constantly taking place. Let me, let me show you this quick video. We'll get back to the word of God in just a minute. All right, but we're, we're looking at the life that he made, right? You can see certain features of God's nature and his character inside his own creation. So there is still, I'm still, I'm still playing fair, right? I'm still within the bounds of safe interpretation of scripture, but here we go. Just like a busy city, there's constant motion inside of your cells. There's new construction, demolition, and most importantly, transporting goods from one place in the cell to another. Cells transport goods along cellular roadways. To transport cargo along these roads, the cells use motor proteins. Kinesin is one of these motor proteins. If you didn't have kinesin and other motor proteins, you simply wouldn't be alive. All the cells in your body depend upon these tiny motor proteins to organize and power themselves, to divide and multiply, and to communicate with other cells. 
What we know now is that kinesin effectively has two legs and these legs are able to coordinate a walking motion along a track. That track is called a microtubule and the kinesin undergoes this beautiful choreographed walking action. While the kinesin is walking along this track, at the other end of the kinesin, it gets hooked up to a cargo. These motor proteins move quickly and efficiently. Relative to their size, they move as fast as a car on a freeway. But they're four times more efficient than your car in converting chemical energy into motion. Watching these movements under the microscope, it was fascinating then to figure out how does this motor actually work? How does something that's a millionth of an inch in size generate that motion? My lab at UCSF spent about 10 to 20 years trying to figure out the answer to that question. We know about kinesin now, we know a lot about how it moves, but there's still so many fundamental questions that we don't know about how all this motility is regulated, how all of these cargos know how to go to the right places. There are always new questions that one wants to know the answers to. So we see all of this complexity. We see all of this order. We see all of this function, and it can't arise on its own. All right, Jesus is the one who created the universe, who created life, who created you and I. All right, and when Jesus says in his parable, all right, that the seed is the word of God, and that is the means by which we grow and right, will bear fruit, right, will experience the life that he desires to have. I want you to understand this, okay? Let me read this again. Trees bearing fruit, in which is their seed, each according to its own kind, okay? That the seed, as the King James Version says, is in itself. It's in the plant. It's in the fruit, okay? And we know that life can't spontaneously arise on its own. We know that new kinds cannot arise from other kinds. And so when Jesus says that the word of God is the seed, that that is the means through which life is made, right? That through which the Christian life is shown fruitful, to which we prove to be his disciples, he's telling us the truth. There is no other way that I can live a fruitful Christian life. There's no other combination of good works or trying to serve the poor in my own strength or like trying to be a selfless person or trying to live according to my own moral standards or trying to find my own truth. None of those will ever combine to result in making a different kind that is the kind of life that Jesus wants the believer to have. You can't get the kind of fruitful life that Jesus wants from a different kind, right? <laughs> life creates after its own kind. And Jesus says, this is the only way you get this Christian life, this fruitful life, this joyful life that I want you to have is by spending time in my word and abiding in me. Like, we've got to get that life from him, all right? And it's from the seed of the Word of God. Life does not arrive spontaneously. All right, this isn't going to come about in us by accident. All right, a Christian, a fruitful life, a valuable life, a life that has eternal purpose is only ever going to come about from the seed of the Word of God. You can't get it anywhere else. Like, that's how precious the Word of God is. That is what the Word of God is able to do, to produce in us new life. And it doesn't come from anywhere else. All right, just as evolution cannot mathematically produce novel function, right, new proteins, new kinds, right, it can't explain where all of this structure and order and regulatory systems come from, right, you're not going to get the life that God wants you to have with any other combination of things. It's impossible.
It's, in, it's impossible. It will not arise by chance. And so this is what I want to point out. This is the value of the Word of God. That believing the Word of God will change you when you hold fast to it. All right, this is what Jesus said in John chapter 6. All right, uh, speaking to a crowd that ended up, they all left him. All right, he says, it is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. All right, the words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Okay, it's only by his word that life can originate in us. It's only by believing in him, in his words, that we can be born again, born of the Spirit. And after Jesus said some other offensive things, the whole crowd leaves him and he turns to his disciples and says, are you going to leave also? Right, and Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. All right, there's no other source for eternal life. What Peter proclaimed here is still true today. You cannot get eternal life apart from Jesus. Life does not spontaneously arise by chance, okay? It's not going to happen. And there's only one kind that produces this kind. There's only one person. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And it's only he that can produce life after his kind. All right, where else can we find this? We cannot. And this is what's also cool. It produces after its kind, right? Check this out, 1 John 3. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. Keyword practice there. Okay, we, st- we still screw up. We still stumble. James himself says that. We will fail to perfectly live out what the Holy Spirit leads us to do. But it says, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning, right? That's not our aim. That's not our goal. That's not what we seek after. And this is why. It says, for God's seed abides in him. And he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. All right, that the kind of life that God's word produces is one that is like Jesus. All right, one that is like Jesus. He was holy and now we desire to be holy. Okay, that God's word in us, it, that kind of seed can't like suddenly evolve into a different kind of life. No, there's only one kind of Christian life that it will produce. There's only one kind, the kind that cannot keep sinning, right? We're going to become more and more like Jesus, that as we hold fast to that word of God with patience, we will bear fruit. And so we don't keep on sinning. We will stumble, but we will not make provision for the lusts of the flesh, right? We're, we're going to allow God's word to prune away the things in us, to put to death the things in us that are contrary to his word right? We let his word remain in us, and this is the only kind of life it can produce. And so if if you wanted a life where you could keep sinning, where practicing sinning was going to be your lifestyle, the only way you can achieve that is you need to remove God's word from your life. You need to nullify its effectiveness. You need to choose to reject the things that Jesus says, right? And, And that's what you would have to do. But I want to point out, like, that would be foolishness, foolishness, right? We as Christians, it's the word of God that produces life in us, but it's the word of God that also prunes us to continue to make us more like him. And so we can't dismantle the value and the preciousness and the power of the scriptures, right? God's word is powerful to bring about change in us, Right? We can't just be like, oh, I'm going to believe in God and love and assume that my life is going to turn out the way it needs to. No, because when we read God's word, there will be things in us that it corrects, but it's for our good. And it, we would be less fruitful if we avoid it. We would be less equipped if we don't let it produce change in us. This is what... Uh, Paul writes in 2 Timothy, he says, all scripture, 
all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable, right? It's, it's helpful for us. It's going to, it's the words of spirit and life. It's the words of eternal life, like Jesus and Peter were saying, right? It's the thing that's going to produce in us the fruit that God desires that results in other people seeing in us so, so that he is glorified, right? The word of God is profitable for teaching, Right? That it's going to further reveal truth to us. It's profitable for reproof, for correction. That when my life is contrary to the word of God, I'm the one living a lie and God's word is true. Right? Like I can't be like, oh, no, I just don't like that verse or I'm going to avoid that passage. No, no. Like I need to allow God's word to correct me. Right? And for training in righteousness that I need God's word to make me more like him, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work, right? That we want to be uh, complete, not incomplete. We want to be fruitful, not unfruitful. We want to be prepared for all of the good works that God's called us to do, and we won't be able to if we don't allow the word of God to produce this change in us. And the enemy knows the value of the word of God, right? This is like the weird thing, like both God and the enemy are in agreement on this, and we're the only ones that sometimes disagree. They both agree that the word of God is incredibly powerful to produce change, all right? The enemy tries to snatch the word of God away from people's hearts, lest they believe and are saved, All right, the enemy is the one whose strategy is to twist or distort or bring about confusion in the word of God, right? Saying to Jesus when he's tempted, if you're the son of God, then right, turn this stone to bread or cast yourself down from this mountain, right? All of these things where he tries to twist scripture and bring to doubt our status, our relationship with God, right? Or or what he says to Eve, uh, did God really say that? Right? Did God really say that? Like he brings doubt in the word of God and that results in her having less understanding of reality and making foolish decisions because of it. Or when he, he says, yeah, I know the word of God, like God said that there would be a consequence to our sinful choices. Surely you shall not die, right? The enemy attacks the word of God because he knows it's the means through which we are brought to life and the means to which we bear fruit, and the means to which God prunes us, and we are made more fruitful. And so we as believers need to cherish the word of God, allow it to change us, to produce fruit in us. Let's see. I think I'm going to end on this concept. And so the seed is in itself, right? The seed is in itself, that the life of a Christian changed by God's word is saturated with God's word, that we produce more generations of Christians, right? In the garden, Jesus says, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. In the New Testament, Jesus says, go into all the nations and preach the gospel, making disciples, teaching them to observe what I've taught you, right? All that I've commanded. Right, That when we are full of the word of God, the seed is in the fruit of our lives. The word of God is being shown and displayed to other people. That we can produce life in other people, not because of our own good works, not because of them trying to imitate our fruit, but by them receiving the word of God, right? Receiving God's word and what he says to be true, right? That we being changed by God's word, being fruitful by God's word, become self-replicating life forms, right? In which we are the means through which God plans on bringing more people to life in this world, right? And Jesus commands us to. And so I want to point out, God desires fruit, right? And the way that we're going to do that is by abiding in Jesus, spending time in his word, allowing it to bring about faith in us because 
hearing comes and faith comes by hearing and hearing comes by the word of God. Right? And so just allow your heart to respond to God's word. Right? Receive it with joy, but hold it fast that you won't be shaken right, when life gets difficult, that you won't be lured away or enticed by the cares of this world or the deceitfulness of of riches, right? The Word of God is the only thing that can produce this kind of change in life in us. So take care now how you hear. This is what, take care then how you hear, right? All of the people in Jesus' parable heard the Word of God but we've got to choose how we respond to it, that we wouldn't be slow to believe, that we wouldn't be dull of hearing, that we wouldn't be hard-hearted, but we would be humble and receive his word as he speaks it. Whew. All right. I think that middle, middle third was all about just science and stuff. Uh, <laughs> I, if you, I might be able to share out some links to some of those resources if you're interested. Um, I mean, it's really simple, though. The idea is that God's word is the means through which he produces change. And we've all experienced an amount of growth or fruit in our lives. Let's continue to stir each other up towards good works. Let's continue to uh, desire to see God do great things in us. Uh, right? We want to see God produce fruit in us, and, we, and not for our own sake but that our own families would come to trust in him and glorify God and that our community would come to know the God that loves them, right? Who, who gave life to them and gave his life for them. Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, so much for your kindness and goodness. We thank you that you were faithful to preserve your word, that we can have confidence in the scriptures, that we can continue to, to read it and see and experience and believe it uh, exactly as it promises, uh, that your promises continue to be yes and amen. I thank you that, Lord, we can understand and enjoy and appreciate aspects of who you are through your creation, uh, that you allow us to be in this world and enjoy the, the good things of this world. Uh, but we can only more fully understand who you are as you're revealed in your scriptures and through your son. And so I pray, God, that we would all make space and time to be with you, to worship you, to be in your word, and that, Lord, we would respond with obedience to your word, uh, that we would not take it lightly. Uh, and, Lord, I thank you in advance for the incredible fruit that your word will bring about in. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.